Thank you, Anna. Good morning. First, I would like to thank ISSCC for inviting me today. It really is a wonderful honor to, to be here with you and uh, to share a perspective of uh, what's next in computing. And I thought I would begin by uh, showing you uh, a picture of where I work. This is the TJ Watson Research Laboratory in Yorktown Heights. Uh, it serves as the headquarters of IBM Research, which is the organization I have the privilege of leading. And in that building alone, we have about 1,700 scientists and, and engineers. And it forms part of a global network of laboratories. And uh, this very month, 75 years ago, uh, IBM Research uh, was founded. Today, we have 3,000 scientists uh, distributed uh, across all over the world. But what has always bound us and brought us together as a community, a community of physicists and material scientists and mathematicians and electrical engineers and experts in AI, has been this focus on what is next in information and what is next in computation. And I think we live now in the most exciting time in computing that we have had in over 50 years. And it is because the convergence of three core areas, and I'd like to be able to unpack what is happening. And basically, you know, the thesis is that what is next is computing, is this combination of bits plus neurons plus qubits. And it's useful to reflect what we have had over the last 50 or 60 years, and what are these dimensions that we're going to be adding and the implications that it will have. I think it would be fair to say that if we were to summarize uh, the last 60 years of computing, we would talk about the world of bits. And we would have to start that journey by the intellectual edifice that Cloud Shannon built for us. And in the creation of information theory, or what we now know as classical information theory, he taught us to think about information abstractly. He taught us that idea of the binary digit, the bit, the zeros and ones. And he says we could separate the informational representation from the meaning of what we were trying to process. In fact, he did another assumption. He separated information from physics itself. And we'll come a little bit later when I talk about quantum to explore whether that separation was actually correct or not. But in that abstraction, in thinking about these zeros and ones as sort of this world of almost platonic ideals of like perfection, um, it allowed us to actually see the world differently. And we could come to appreciate that things as different as an old punch card or DNA, where prior to Cloud Shannon, we would have thought those things have nothing in common. Now, of course, we get to see them and understand that they're both carriers and processors of information. The companion idea that was empirical in nature, of course, was what we all know in this community as Gordon Moore and derivatives and different versions of it, like Denard scaling. And it's been an extraordinary success. I mean, just to reflect a minute of how sophisticated the systems we can build today, thanks to many decades of making bits cheaper and more efficient, if you look at, for example, a uh, latest generation of uh, Z15 uh, 15 system that uh, we launched late last year, a single microprocessor there now contains 9.1 billion transistors built with 14 nanometer technology. And you can engineer systems now where a single machine can have seven nines of reliability. Well, the average amount of unplanned downtime in a year is three seconds. And a single machine can process over a trillion web transactions per day to give a flavor. We also know that we can take this technology and scale it out. And if you look at an example of the most powerful supercomputer in the world that we installed at the Department of Energy a year and a half ago, the machine is capable of processing 200,000 trillion calculations per second. Now, every once in a while, I think our community is good to sort of step back and you reflect and you look at the numbers because they're really, really staggering and impressive what uh, we've all been able to achieve on that. But perhaps the most profound implication in making bits almost essentially free has been enabling digital communities and giving access to computation all over the world. This is an example of open communities contributing to open source to just one week of, the lin of uh, contributing to Linux and the Linux kernel. It's over 20 million software developers around the world and millions of them that earn a living writing software and millions of them contribute to open source. And it's a really good testament that that has been enabled by the success of this community and advances and making bits so ubiquitous. But we also know that in the end, we really do have fundamental limits in the current approach. 
In the end, we have atoms. And uh, this is an, a good example also of very nice work that was done in uh, the Almaden Research Laboratory of IBM, where the team was exploring how many atoms do you need to be able to store a bit. And in this demonstration, using a, a scanning tunneling microscope, they were able to individually manipulate iron atoms. And it turns out that they could do it with 12 atoms of iron to store a single bit. So what you see here is the word think, spelled with ASCII characters, and with 480 atoms being able to store that. I'll bring a point about this a little bit later. So that was a little bit in a nutshell, right? The extraordinary progress we've achieved with bits. So what's next? Well, of course, we're going to continue to push the limits. And it was in the previous wonderful talk, we show examples of how we're going to continue to push density scaling and new device architectures. But there's another dimension where the representation of information and the way we represent information coupled with architectures is going to give us a lot of power. So here we're going to bring two fields together with this idea of information. We're going to bring biology plus information as inspiration, and we're going to bring physics plus information. So let me begin with the world of neurons. This is perhaps a scientist that you haven't heard about, although I would encourage that you all, you know, one of my pieces of advocacy is that he should be much more broadly credited, uh, particularly in the connection of what we're seeing now with artificial intelligence. This is Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, he won the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine, and he is uh, clearly one of the pioneers of modern neuroscience. He was among the first to understand that in our brain we have this cell structure called neurons, and that the neurons have these long tails called axons, and that the intersection of axons, we form synapses, and that those synapses are deeply connected to memory and learning. He was um, an extraordinary illustrator as well. You're seeing on the right-hand side the diagrams that he would hand-draw uh, looking under the, the microscope. And to be fair, it wasn't with any more than that biological inspiration that starting in the 1940s and 50s, mathematicians created an abstraction. And we began to see this idea of an artificial neural network, perhaps with less layers depicted here. But we began to see these diagrams we're also familiar with, which each blue dot represents a neuron. Neurons are organized hierarchically in layers. And the white lines depict the synapses, quote unquote. And when we say that we're training a neural network, we mean nothing more than learning the strength of those white lines. And then we have some kind of nonlinear function that triggers the activation of the neurons. And as Jeff Dean uh, explained this morning, even though that old idea had been around with a long time, we've seen recently, thanks to the power of bits and the fact that we had digitized the world and we had a lot of labeled data to train these neural networks, and the power of computation that this old idea has begun to work recently, and it has delivered a lot of benefits. Now, there's two sort of like core challenges, there are many more, but two fundamental challenges that we as a community continue to face in AI, particularly with this sort of neural network-based implementation of AI. And one has to do with this insatiable need for labeled data. And I'll make, uh, you know, I'll pass on a joke uh, from David Cox, who heads our MIT IBM AI lab, where he says the problem with automation is that it's too labor intensive. And the, the joke on this is you see, for example, I'm referencing here an article written by Kate Metz in the New York Times, kind of like under the rug of the AI stories, the tens of thousands, right, of humans who are labeling data behind the scenes to be able to implement uh, these neural networks on land. And the world is not swimming in labeled data. And so there is an inherent challenge. I'm not going to talk about some of these areas, but it's a very fundamental area where we're working very hard to be able to learn with a lot less data, and the community is addressing this. But I want to tackle the second part, which is the unbounded computational uh, demands. Now, Jeff also showed this chart, so I won't elaborate on the, on the right-hand side, about sort of like the rate of demand in terms of computational power uh, to train. And this was the analysis that was done by OpenAI. But just remember this idea of like the computational demand is doubling every three and a half months. So what can we do about that? Um, so there's one field um, that has been discussed uh, in this morning, which is obviously we can do reduced precision architectures um, because they are well suited to the flexibility and the simplicity of operations that neural networks afford us. 
So I'll just say something very briefly on that, but I want to touch today on a second theme around analog computing and some of the opportunities. Just one word on reduced precision architectures. Jeff alluded this morning about the power of reduced precision for inferencing. Um, for training, this is also viable. And in 2015, uh, we published work uh, at ICML showing how you can do reduced precision architectures for training, not just for inferencing. And here, and, and at that time, it was demonstrated with 60 bits of precision. You had to do some tricks in terms of stochastic rounding and how you implemented that. But basically, you could do that with no loss of accuracy. Since then, we demonstrated that uh, as well for 8-bit. And there is a roadmap for both training and inferencing of pushing towards reduced precision. So that's um, a very you know, sort of rich and fruitful area. And there's a lot of activity in the community around implementing these native architectures with reduced precision. But how do we drive uh, a few orders of magnitude beyond these digital core implementations with reduced precision? Um, so it was, uh, you know, in the previous talk, a little bit of discussion of the idea of in-memory computing and what could you do. So I would like to show you some results uh, in that space. The idea is also have been with us a long time, uh, is of implementing these systolic arrays where um, basically you can have some resistive processing unit, in this case, that you could implement with some memory or quasi-memory device. And because we have this variable conductance in this RPU, uh, we are able to store the weights na natively in, uh, in those units. And then we can take advantage of Kirchhoff's law to have these sort of um, you know, control voltage pulses in the uh, horizontal rows. And then when we read the columns, just uh, by reading the current, we get the multiply accumulate function that is inherent in the matrix multiplications that happens within a neural network. So it's an elegant and clever idea that allows you to sort of overcome this von Neumann bottleneck of trying to fetch memory all the time by storing the weights in the RPUs, and then you get to officially implement the multiply accumulate function uh, and, and do that uh, effic efficiently. So how do you build that device? So what are the options we have? An ideal resistive processing unit will have a set of characteristics. Fundamentally among them would be the idea that they have to have symmetric switching. Um, we don't care about that in a traditional memory, but here when you want to be able to store the weights, let's say between 0 and 1 and 1 to 0, you would like that on both going up and down, you have this sort of symmetric characteristic. Today, if you use a phase change memory element to give you an example, you can achieve fine gradation, relatively fine gradation, uh, in one direction, but then you get very asymmetric switching behavior. Having said that, what could you do with the memory devices we have? So we've been working on this for a number of, of years, and uh, we have built, uh, let me go back uh, one, we have built an analog AI chip uh, that has over 700,000 phase change memory devices um, to implement some of these core neural network architectures. And this has been very interesting work, and here is just to show you a res uh, an example of AI chips results where I implementing a ResNet32 uh, neural network that has been using the CIFAR10 uh, image classification data set. And what you can see here are the results. On blue, you're seeing the inference performance in terms of test accuracy um, using a digital implementation with 32 floating uh, point uh, operation. And you're seeing in red uh, the results of the analog chip, where within 0.5% of the test accuracy of this. So it's a really, really interesting result. And uh, it shows a testament of the progress. Now, there's a lot of details underneath of what you actually have to do to make this work, including dealing with the asymmetric conductance response that you see across the devices, the granularity that you can achieve in terms of the conductance changes, as well as the variability that is going to be inherently present from device to device, and also conductance drift, the drift that will happen within a device. So all of these things are behind the scenes. There's a lot of details to be able to implement this efficiently, but it's a good testament of what is going to be possible using analog uh, systems. And we're also working, <laughs> leveraging our expertise in the physical sciences, about creating this ideal RPU that has these symmetric switching capabilities. And here's a recent result. Uh, um, that I've included the reference there, 
about uh, actually using our expertise that we develop uh, uh, creating hafnium oxides dielectrics uh, uh, as part of our high metal gate efforts in the 90s and 2000s to be able to now create devices with filaments where you get this symmetric switching. And this is an experimental result that you're seeing on the right-hand side. So what is this journey that is going to give us? If you plot it all together in, uh, in this performance, remember we have these computational demands of doubling every three and a half months. I think we certainly see a roadmap of being able to deliver at least two and a half X per year in terms of computing performance for these kinds of deep neural networks. And we're going to see this journey between the current digital systems, the reduced precision digital architectures, and beyond that, um, either having uh, mixed systems or analog systems. And I think this may be particularly important as we bring edge AI, where we may be much more uh, you know, sort of constrained by the amount of power that we have available on bringing these analog architectures. So just to sort of like wrap up this dimension of what is happening today in sort of the neural-based architectures on AI, I think without a doubt the last decade has seen these extraordinary advances of deep learning and it's been clearly demonstrated as a community that for well-defined tasks in single domains, we can achieve superhuman accuracy if you have large amounts of labeled data and enough computational power, typically using CPUs for inferencing and GPUs for training. The next step, of course, is we need to be able to bring within uh, the structure more tasks across more domains, and very fundamentally, how do we learn from less? Right? We need to be able to learn from less data and be able to create trusted AI systems. And the computational demands of this are also going to be very important and powerful. And we're going to see this continued advancement towards reduced precision architectures and analog AI hardware. And this, of course, will go then towards this journey towards more, more and more general AI capabilities. So I'd like to now bring a third dimension for what is next of computing. If mathematics and information coming together gave us the world of bits, and biology and information gave us the world of neurons, it is physics and information that brings us the world of qubits. For us at IBM Research, the journey of thinking about quantum information dates back to the 1960s and 70s, specifically to Rolf Landauer and Charlie Bennett. Rolf uh, was an IBM fellow and uh, you know, an extraordinary physicist, and he hired at the time Charlie Bennett. Uh, let me note that that's a picture of Charlie now, not then. And, uh, and as physicists, they began to start ask uh, specific kinds of questions, probing into that assumption that Cloud Shannon had put forth of separating physics and information. And they would ask questions like this. They would say, is there a fundamental limit to the energy efficiency of computation? Or they would ask questions like, is information processing thermodynamically reversible? It's only the kinds of questions that physicists would ask, right, of these kinds of things. And pulling down that thread, it emerged a new area, which we now know as quantum information theory. This is a picture of Charlie's notebook uh, that we share, he shared with me a couple years ago. And uh, notice, um, it's, we think it's the first instance that those words were written down, quantum information theory coming together. And uh, notice the date on the upper left-hand side. It says 1970, right? That's how, how long we've been on that journey. And what the community developed over time is the discovery that the fundamental building block of information is not the bit with zeros and ones, but something known as the qubit, the quantum bit. And specifically, there were three ideas from physics that got incorporated into the representation of information. And they are the ideas of superposition, the idea of entanglement, and the idea of interference. So let me briefly uh, describe each. Uh, superposition is something, of course, very straightforward to, to understand because we have a really classic analogy. In this case, let me just say, like, imagine we have a coin and we have heads or tails, zeros and ones, and when the coin is spinning, if I ask you, is it heads or tails, we would, of course, say, well, it's kind of in a superposition of heads and tails. When we perform the measurement, we will get one or the other. So in our quantum world, imagine that we have a sphere and that we can represent uh, the state uh, by, going, by picking a vector going from the center of this field, say, to the North Pole. We can call that a 1. When we're in the South Pole is a 0, we can put it in the equator and have a superposition of 0 and 1, but we can also put the vector wherever we want on the sphere. 
So the second idea is a very you know, profound idea, the idea of entanglement. And now I'm not going to do it justice, but I'm going to give you uh, a little bit of insight around this. And, um, and here, uh, basically, what it tells us is that the state of entangled particles, in our case, the qubits that we use for computation, cannot be described independently of one another. So let's go back to our coins for a second. So if we have two coins, and in classical world, they were spinning, when we perform the simultaneous measurement, whether one is heads or tails is totally independent of whether the other one is heads or tails. The probabilities are independent. In quantum world, if these coins were entangled, when we perform the measurement, now we can be in a situation that when one is heads, the other one is always heads, or one is tails, the other one is always tails. This is kind of like a mind-blowing thing that is like an earth is not flat kind of moment, right? Like if you actually think about what's happening, because you can have non-local interaction in the universe. And this is the very idea that Einstein never liked, right? He criticized it by calling spooky action at a distance as a criticism. And yet, that is something that is present, and there's a connection between entanglement and the world of information. And the relationship has an exponential character, meaning that if we have qubits that have these entangled properties, if we are to describe all the states of this entangled uh, situation using zeros and ones, we need an exponential number of them. So as an example, when we have 100 qubits, if they were perfectly entangled with one another, we would need to devote every atom of planet Earth to store zeros and ones. And remember, I told you I needed 12 atoms right, to store a bit, but I'm you know, letting that one slide. Let's imagine one atom, one bit. You would need that many. By the time you have 280 qubits that were perfectly entangled, you will need to devote every atom of the known universe to store zeros and ones. So that's an interesting property right, to exploit. The third idea is the idea of interference. We're all very accustomed to that, waves in the oceans and acoustic waves where we can have constructive interference that form peaks, and we can have destructive interference that can cancel things out. All right, so we're going to bring those three ideas together to give you an intuition for how a quantum algorithm works. So we go back to our sphere that I told you about. The first thing we do in a quantum computer is we put the computer in a superposition of states. So we're going to have a very simple quantum computer with two qubits. The number of states that are available to us is 2 to the power n. Okay? So in this case, we have two qubits. So 2 to the power of 2 is 4. So we're going to have four dots in our sphere, right? So representing 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 state. So we're going to represent each dot in this sphere. The next thing that we do is we put data into the quantum computer. In practice, to simplify things, all that means is a rotation of one of those state vectors in that sphere, meaning we're going to change the phase of where it is in the sphere because we're putting data in. And the third and sophisticated step is the construction of the algorithm itself. And the process of writing a good quantum algorithm is the process of taking those, sta those states with amplitude and phases and interfere them with one another such that the right answer is maximized and the answers we don't care about get cancel each other out. Mathematically, we get to exploit the fact that we have negative probabilities now present in the system, and that's where the real power of the quantum system is. The reason this matters is because from an information theory perspective, the problems that we can solve with classical machines are limited to those that don't blow up in the number of variables that we have to compute over. We know that we have another class of problems. You know, an example of that class of problems are NP-hard problems, but no, no, that's not the only class, um, where the number of variables grow, blows up exponentially. Factoring is a good example of a class of problems that have that characteristic, but so is simulating physics. The original idea of Richard Feynman of uh, imagining creating a quantum computer um, was about simulating nature itself, right? And if you want to do calculations with materials, the number of calculations of Schrodinger's equations that you've got to solve is exponential with the number of electrons that are present in that structure. And those are problems that it's not a question that you can solve maybe two years from now, four years from now. They're literally impossible to solve given the number of variables we have to compute over. And the best we can do is approximation. Now, notice I'm not claiming that quantum computers will solve all of those problems. But that is the only technology we know where there's a subset of those problems that can be tackled through quantum systems. 
In fact, you'll notice that it goes out of traditional hard problems because the, you know, if you look at factoring as an example, that's a problem that is hard to compute but easy to verify that you have the right answer. When you simulate, you use, uh, simulate quantum physics or, you know, or chemistry, it's both hard to calculate and hard to verify. So it's a different complexity class altogether called BMP. OK, so that's for a foundation. So can you build these machines? Right? And can you, you know, start solving problems with them? In some ways, we find ourselves in a similar moment to when this picture was taken. This is 1944 at Bletchley Park. And uh, this is a Colossus Mark II. And it was you know, what is now appreciated to be as the first programmable electronic digital computer right? um, that now we all uh, you know, derivatives of which we've benefited today. And in some ways, over the last few years, is the very first time where we have built the first programmable quantum computers. And it's a picture uh, of one of the systems in our laboratory in Yorktown Heights. And the interesting thing about it is that for most of human history, there were only like a few laboratories around the world where a few physicists were able to build like single qubit or a few multi qubit device. And if you wanted to be able to do something with them, you had to actually build an environment that looked like this and maintain it and sustain it yourself. And this is pretty much what things looked like you know, until four or five years ago. And then something interesting happened. Um, in May 2016, three and a half years ago, uh, we were you know, the first company in the world to build a small quantum computer programmable system and make it available universally through, through the cloud. And, um, and what we allowed anybody to do is to sit in front of any computer, any, any terminal, and be able to do, to do this. Uh, basically, you're seeing here a quantum score. Uh, you read it like a musical score, where you are able to deploy gates um, and operations in the in classical world. This will be your ands and your ors and your nots and so on. Uh, in the world of quantum, you have those, but like you also have different gate operations. You put them out in sequence, and then you implement this circuit, and you click Run. And, um, and basically, this is a system we created. You sit in front, you write a program, you send the zeros and ones um, you know, over the internet, and when um, it arrives to the quantum systems, we convert the zeros and ones to microwave pulses operating at about 5 gigahertz. We send those microwave pulses uh, through um, this you know, uh, cryostat. It operates the quantum processor at 15 millikelvin. It's one of the coldest places in the universe. And there, we implement these superposition, entanglement, and interference operations. We extract the signal, and we amplify uh, the signal out, and we convert it back to zeros and ones uh, for the users. And uh, this is what happened. So we made that available, and this has been the growth of an entire new community interested in this world of computation. You're seeing the users of the IBM quantum community that we have enabled, uh, and there's a companion open source environment called Quizkit, and you're seeing here the users all over, across over 150 countries, right? There's been 120 plus billion experiments that have been run now using our systems. And I'll show you a little bit uh, some of the uh, scientific publications. And associated with this, it's a whole emergence of institutions from national laboratories, universities, and, um, and, uh, and private sector and industry. These are all the partners who have joined who are now exploring and developing you know, algorithms for quantum computing. So it's been an amazing thing of what has happened in just three short years. The technology we use uh, for us, there's different ways to implement quantum systems. The two leading uh, contenders are, of course, the superconducting base uh, systems and the ion-based systems. I'm sure you all will read there's many, many different proposals, but in terms of relative maturity, uh, those are the, the two leading uh, contenders. This is an example of the kinds of systems uh, that, that we build. You're seeing these uh, uh, superconducting coaxial cables of those long wires. At the bottom of the canister there is where the quantum processor goes. Um, for us, we use a device called the Transmon uh, qubit. Ultimately, it's this Josephson Junction device that is 100 nanometers by 100 nanometers, depicted on the uh, bottom right-hand side of the figure. And that creates a well-defined two-state system, which is needed, as you know, uh, Di Vincenzo uh, taught us, to be able to create uh, this quantum information processing environment and basically allows us to do this ground and an excited state in a controlled fashion. And it's um, uh, a sandwich of basically aluminum and aluminum oxide 
uh, that gets in the junction. And then you see the wiggly lines uh, that connect between the qubits. Uh, those are the, uh, the different coupling devices. Uh, you got to be able to create that entanglement and superposition between qubits. And you also need to be able to do the readout and, and sending the signal in. So those are where the different resonators are in present. There's a lot of details underneath that I'm not going to go into. This is for a planar device. As you build larger and larger ones, you have to break the plane. And there's a whole set of technology that has to do with packaging and how do you actually do connection by breaking the plane. That is a lot of secret sauce in there. And there's a lot of important work also on the topology of these qubit devices that you build. Um, at present, we have 15 deployed quantum computers that are available online. And uh, this is an example of all the different topologies that we make available for the community. And all of them have different reasons, between 5 qubits, 16 qubits, 20 qubits. And we have a 53 qubit uh, machine as well that we make available. Now, what is important, even though I talked about qubits, um, don't over-access on the qubit or over-index in the number of qubits. It's easy with lithography to print lots of qubits. What's really, really hard is to couple them and the error rate that is present in two qubit operations. right? Um, the challenge that we have with current quantum machines is, is that they're subject to noise. Um, you know, if you look at the difficulty of building a quantum computer, is you have to balance the isolation that is required to create this entanglement state. But if you isolate the machine entirely, you cannot send the data in and out. So it's this balance between isolation and sending information in and out, and information of core care is energy which is what allows those qubits then to entangle with other things in the world, and they decohere, and you lose the special property. So it's really important to understand that the power of a quantum computer, in this metric we've defined called quantum volume, is both the number of qubits that you have present, but also the connectivity and the error rate that is present between these qubits. And that you've got to move across this diagonal of lowering the error rate. Today, state-of-the-art error rates about 1%. Um, but the reality is they need to get about 100x better um, you know, to do some real inflection point. But I want to show you the progress that we're making and the power of having a roadmap and delivering this capability. Um, this is, of course, Moore's Law. Here's experimental results of machines that we have built over the last now four years, where we've been demonstrating that we're doubling the quantum volume experimentally every year, from quantum volume of 4 to 8 to 16, and right before Christmas, the team uh, built a new system that doubled again to quantum volume of 32. And uh, this is the one we affectionately call Gambetta's Law for Jay Gambetta, who is like, you know, a very well-known leader in the field and who heads our quantum efforts in IBM research. And if we, so what we're doing here is doubling the power of these systems every year. And if we keep at that rate, there are going to be some pretty spectacular results that are going to happen in the next five years. So at present, to give you a feeling, we have 15 deployed systems. They have 97% utilization that we make available. Over 220,000 registered users. We have over 12,000 monthly active users using our systems now. And uh, over 150 billion executions. There have been over 220 scientific publications that have been enabled by using uh, our systems. So where are we right, in terms of summary on the quantum front? I think we've gone from this multi-decade journey of fundamental quantum science, and that is going to continue. There are so many scientific things we still have to overcome and achieve to build these, ultimately, these uh, fault-tolerant quantum machines. But we're undoubtedly in a different phase, too. We're in this phase of getting the world quantum ready, learning how do you program these areas, developing intellectual property, learning the skills, teaching the curriculum to a whole new generation of computer scientists that are going to learn about this, similar to what has happened over the last decade in the world of machine learning and AI. And in the next, you know, now within this decade for sure, and you know, my belief fundamentally is within the next three to five years, entering this era of quantum advantage, where we will get to use quantum computers for scientific and commercial advantage. And this is very, very exciting because something that was decades out now is within you know, this decade and the years ahead. So I want to close by now bringing these ideas together. I've made the argument that the story of the future of computing is not just more and cheaper bits, but that information representation in terms of, for example, neural architectures and you know, quantum-based uh, information processing, coupled with a new generation of hardware, and devices is going to unleash a tremendous potential. 
Now, these bits plus neurons and qubits of underlying fabric are going to have to be orchestrated by a secure heterogeneous computational fabric of the hybrid cloud. And I think there's another layer that I didn't get to talk today about AI-driven automation and automated programming that is going to be very, very important. But I want to close by touching on the implications that this is going to have for how science itself is conducted and how discovery itself will happen. Sometimes when you share the progress that is happening in technology and computation, you know, the general public kind of, you know, can have a mixed reaction. They're impressed by the progress, but they're also scared by it. And I like to point out that we have not run out of problems to solve in the world. Right? And that if you look across from agriculture to energy and aerospace and pharma, the possibilities of discovering faster a whole new generation of materials from improved, for example, fertilizers, uh, for agriculture, to new catalysts to make CO2 conversion more efficient, or a whole new generation uh, of antibiotics is fundamentally important to our well-being and society. And that the possibility that we have here, think about just for a second on closing, the argument of how we discover with the advent of computers. A new material class, when computers came about, we imagined that instead of relying so heavily on experimentation, we can use computers to simulate those materials. And that has been the world of high-performance computer. Now you have the AI community saying, excuse me, you don't have to be able to do uh, first principle physics simulations. You can actually use data as a means to drive discovery. And they're also right. And then you have the quantum crowd who, as I mentioned, the Richard Feynman idea, you said you can build machines that work like nature, to be able to model and simulate in nature. And they're also right. So imagine what's going to happen when those three distinct methodologies converge together to have a new workflow of going from deep search, using all the previous literature, to do intelligent simulation assisted by quantum and AI and classical computing, to use generative models that are AI giving us to have an act of creativity and imagination and autonomous labs. And that is the world that is ahead. Thank you.